The text today, Deuteronomy 30, 19. This is the third message in the series called The Blessed Life. You're living, you're living the blessed life or the cursed life. I promise you, blessed is better. Deuteronomy 30, 19 says, I call heaven and earth to witness today against you that I have set before you life and death. Blessing, cursing, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. Today's text, the words of Jesus. Wow. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where there's neither moth nor rust and no thieves who break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Give the Lord one great shout of praise and a hand offering of victory in the name of Jesus. You may be seated and thank you for standing so long this morning. I want to put you into the blessed life by reminding you what I have said the past couple weeks. I said the blessed life begins with tithing. That means the first tenth of all your gross income belongs to the Lord. If you want to live the blessed life, you will start tithing immediately and you'll never stop. No matter how circumstances come against you, you'll not hear the voice of the devil. You'll not listen to the voice of fear. You'll be a tither to the day you go home to Jesus. Amen. That's where it begins. Last week I told you there has to be a, a made-up mind where you are tenacious and there is a tenacity in your spirit. You joined a man named Shama who said, I have walked away from this pea patch for the last time. I've been passing out some treats during the blessed life. I've got another one for you next week. And it's interesting, last week I passed out a can of peas with a label on it said, I've walked away from this pea patch for the last time. The first week I passed out all kinds of Hershey Kisses. Do you know that I could not give away all those cans of peas last week? I, I, it dawned on me I had an epiphany that chocolate's more popular than pea. You could have told me that. And today, I'm all about this word treasure. If you want to live the blessed life, you must get your treasure right. Come on, church. I want to deal with you on what I call the treasure principle. A principle is a conviction. A principle is a standard. A principle is a truth that you don't negotiate that you don't argue about. I've heard people say before, well, I've argued with God about that. Well, i got news for you. You may have argued with God about that, but he didn't argue with you about that. Because God is God. He is right always. He is perfect in all his ways. He does not negotiate. When God sets in motion a law, a commandment, a precept, a standard, a principle, they are without apology and they will, are without fail and they are without ending. They are eternal. The principles that I'm going to share with you today and you're going to write down 10 of them on that blue piece of paper that we gave you because these are life changing truths. Come on somebody. I promise you that once you get a hold of this nobody ever has to struggle with your financial life because God will take these principles and impregnate your spirit and you'll be changed forever and you'll get free out of the tyranny of financial pressure. Anybody think that sounds like good news to me? Somebody, amen. Because there's no pressure like financial pressure and we're going to see God continue to bless his people. Jesus said these words. First of all, he acknowledged that we all have treasures. He made this investment uh, advice for all of us. He said, you know, everybody has treasures. Now, your treasure chest may not be as big as somebody else's. What you think is, is valuable may not be valuable to others. And compared to someone else, you may feel small and insignificant, but I promise you, you and I are like that little woman with that little bitty alabaster box. 
and she had a choice. She said, I could keep this in my house and look at it, or I could come to Jesus and lavish it on his feet. Two weeks from the day, we're going to lavish an extravagant offering at the feet of Jesus. Be praying and let God instruct you because there's nothing like being generous with the God who thought you was to die for. Amen. And so she said, I made a commitment. I made a decision. And people scorned her and mocked her and tried to push her out of the way. But she went all the way to the feet of Jesus. She kissed his feet. She washed his feet with her hair. And she lavished her treasure upon him. And Jesus said, you've got treasure. Everybody does. You have a choice. Are you going to let your treasure be corrupted in a corrupted world? Or are you going to send it on? Listen, you can't take your treasure with you, but you can send it on ahead. Amen. So lay up your treasure in heaven. And today, I'm going to give you what I believe are some urgent beliefs and principles that have changed my life. We're going to go to the blessed life school. Now, here's what I've been telling you. The blessed life means when God makes you more than what you can make yourself. Anybody enjoying the blessed life? The cursed life means, and there are people who avoid that word curse. There are preachers who never talk about it. But listen, when I take that which is God's and I keep it, I'm inviting destruction into my life, and I'll never be able to accomplish my destiny as long as I have taken something that is not mine. Your tithe is holy. It's God's. It's yours. It's not yours. It's his. And that curse simply means to be made less. Jesus says you need to lay up your treasures in heaven. Hallelujah. So today I'm going to deal with you about treasures. It might, it might just surprise you to know that Jesus preached on finances, money, more than heaven and hell combined. 1,600 scriptures, verses in the Bible talk about finances. I want you to read this, this quote with me. We may try to divorce from our finances and our faith. We might say, well... I'm not going to talk about finances. I don't want to hear about finances because it has nothing to do with my faith. But in God's eyes, they are inseparable. In God's eyes, they are one in the same. When you look at your heart, that is where you will find your treasure. I want to lay some principles into your life today. How many of you know that God honestly blesses what he says he will bless? And if you want to live the blessed life, find out what God is doing in the blessing business and move in there. Amen. Get under the blessing. Find out what God's Word said about it and just walk in it. And you won't be able to outrun the blessing. You won't have to fight for the blessing. You won't have to worry about being blessed. It will overtake you. If you will be obedient, I wish you'd hear me today, God will make sure that blessing finds you. The psalmist David writes in Psalm 23 and 6, Surely goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life. And I look, and there it is. Every day there's goodness and there's mercy. Come on, somebody. Following you wherever you go. They're just following you. Amen. So, Kenny, you get up. Honey, you be goodness, I'll be mercy. Okay, Kenny, walk. Walk somewhere. Here we go. We're following you. Turn around. Turn. Who's there? Who's there? Who's there? Wherever you go. Why? Because he's been obedient. You got to work out on there, didn't you, baby? Goodness and mercy will follow me. Listen, you don't have to plead and beg and cry and plead your case to God. Oh, God, would you bless me? No, you just need to get in compliance with God's word, and he will see to it. He'll move heaven and earth to honor his word. He will bless you, and you'll be living the blessed life, being made more than you could ever make yourself. Somebody give the Lord a shout of praise if you hear what I'm talking about right now. Get your pen ready. Principle number one, it's this. How I live financially is a direct reflection of my heart. How I live financially cannot be separated from my heart. It is all wrapped together, one in the same. When Zacchaeus, that Bible says a short man, 
climbed up the sycamore tree. He was a tax collector. He had no friends. He was completely ostracized and alone. No one had anything to do with him but talk bad about him and hate him. He was unpopular, and he was all alone, and he climbed up the tree because Jesus was in the crowd, and he could not see because of his stature, and so he just climbed a tree. And the Bible says when Jesus walked under, Luke records that he said, Zacchaeus, come down. He knew his name. How many know Jesus knows your name? Listen, no matter how bad you've been, how many mistakes you made, how many people don't like you, Jesus knows your name. Hallelujah. Today, I don't want you to be like Zacchaeus. I don't want you to be up a tree without Jesus. Hey, come on. So he came down, and Jesus said, I'm coming, and I'm having dinner at your house. Immediately, his heart was changed, and when his heart got changed, his finances got changed. Think about what he said. He said, okay, Jesus. I'm going to give everything I have right now, half of it. I'm giving half of it to feed the poor. And if I've ripped anybody off, if I wronged anybody in my tax collection business, which he did, he said, I'm restoring it fourfold. If I took $10 from somebody, they're getting back 40 What happened? There was a connection made with Jesus, his Savior. And you know, we read in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things become new. All things mean all things. Listen, our attitude when we come to Jesus and we are born again, everything gets born again. Our attitude gets born again, our mouth gets born again, our outlook gets born again, and our finances get born again. Come on. The whole package gets saved. Amen. This is a principle. How I live financially directly is a reflection of my heart. Principle number two. Anybody glad you're here today? is when I give God my treasure, he gives me his. Woo! Let me read it to you. Deuteronomy 28 says, Now it shall come to pass, if you will hearken to the voice of the Lord, and you become obedient, and you will diligently obey the, the word of God, I command a blessing to be set upon you today. Verse 12, And the Lord, amen, the Lord will open up to you his good treasure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. to reign upon you in the land and to bless the work of your hand and you shall lend to many nations and you shall not borrow. Let me tell you something about borrowing money because probably most of us have done it. I've never had to borrow money when I didn't walk away feeling less of a man. The, the borrower is slave to the lender. How many of you know that you can be, you can be on time with, with 45 payments? in a row, and that bank won't call you one time and thank you for it. They won't send you a box of cookies. They won't call you and say, hey, can we take you out to lunch? We see you're never late on your payments, but be one day late one time. And they take their big old thumb out and remind you that you are a slave to them. Am I preaching the truth to somebody? So Jesus says in his word, wherever your treasure is, there your heart is also. We read that when I give my treasure up to God, God opens up his treasure and pours it down on me. And listen, here's what a good goal will be for our 2020 vision. And in just a few, few years of Jesus tarries, we'll be at the year 2020. I would love every family in this church... It may not be your mortgage, but I would love to see every family in this church, their only payment is a mortgage payment where you have live equity and it's not depreciating and it's an investment. Visa is not an investment. Visa is a shark. MasterCard is not an investment. It's a shark. Come on, somebody. And I would love for you to get in debt to nobody. What well, Paul says, we owe nobody anything but love. Come on, church. How many would love to be out of debt? Wouldn't it be good to drive to a house that's paid for in a car that's paid for? Amen. And pet the dog that's finally paid off too? Yay. And Jesus is guaranteeing us that when we put our treasure in heaven, this is called the, the treasure principle. That nobody can come and steal it. 
We've had people at church. They've, they've been in church. I mean, they've been worshiping. They've given. They've loved the Lord. And they've gone home. And when they got there, their door had been broken. Their treasures and their stuff had been taken. And there's nothing like being ripped off. You hurt. You cry. You get angry. You just feel bewildered. You feel uh, molested. You just feel horrible. If a thief comes in your house, you feel dirty because you know that dirty, rotten thief has come in and all the stuff you've lived for and worked for and given your heart to and supplied a good living for your family. He walks us in in five minutes and act like it's his. I hate thieves. And so here's how you avoid that. You put your treasures up there because there's no thieves up there. Come on, somebody. Let me give you another principle. <laughs> Instant gratification only lasts an instant. I was thinking today, I do love me some microwave popcorn. I mean, you know, and listen, if you got to buy the skinny pop, it ain't worth the money. That old skinny, fat-free, no butter, I mean, I'm not, I just might as well not even eat some. Because when I'm going to have popcorn, it's going to be movie theater popcorn. It's going to be extra butter, double butter, amen. I mean, you're going to have to have a paper towel, a roll of paper towels right by you. When you're eating, because you're going to get grease all the way down to your elbows. Come on, somebody. You're with them. I don't know how many bags of microwave popcorn I've probably eaten in my life. At least four or five. Redhead, why laugh ye? A week. But here's the deal. You get, you get satisfied, and then a little bit. You think, man, I sure could use a bag of microwave popcorn. It only lasts an instant. Come on, somebody. Amen. So here's the deal. We've got to look at the life of Moses, and I'm going to give you the next two examples found in Moses. Moses said, look, I will not trade off who I am in God for the pleasures of sin that last just for a moment. You know, he refused to be called Pharaoh's, Pharaoh's son because he knew that it would not last. He could get all the things that that title could bring him, but he said there's pleasure in sin. Let me tell you something about sin. It's fun. Now, let's be honest about it. If it wasn't fun, there wouldn't be a trillions of people living in it. But the problem is payday doesn't always come after you get the fun. It, it comes on later, and it only lasts for a moment. And now you're wondering, okay, what happened? I thought I had fun. It was fun while it lasted, but it ain't no fun no more. Instant gratification. The other thing is this. Lasting joy often comes in a package called sacrifice. Wow. The next verse in Hebrews 11 says that Moses esteeming the reproach of Christ greater than the treasure are the riches in Egypt. For he looked for the reward. For by faith, the word says, that he came and he forsook and he did not, he did not fear the king. And he endured that which was invisible. So here's the deal. When we, when we get into the treasure principle, you and I will understand that there's only gratification for an instance and we've got to sacrifice today for everlasting joy tomorrow here's the other deal number five listen to me listen to me this is huge god owns everything i'm just his manager he says in deuteronomy 8 and 18 and you shall remember the Lord your God, for it's he who gives you the ability to obtain wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to you this day. Haggai 2 and 8 says, God says, all the silver mine is mine and all the gold is mine. You hear about the guy who went to heaven, and he was going into the pearly gates, and there said, stood St. Peter, and, and uh, this guy had like just a boatload of gold. And he said, I've worked hard for this, if you don't mind, I'd like to bring it into heaven with me. I mean, it was a lot of gold the guy had earned. And St. Peter said, well, it's a nice gesture, but we have all the pavement we need. Because you walk on streets of gold. God places very little value on what we die for. Come on, somebody. 
He's interested in our hearts. Principle number six, my heart goes always where I put God's money. My heart follows wherever my treasure is, there will my heart be. When I make an investment, I know some of you are big investors, and you get on the Internet, and you open up, maybe some of you are, I don't know. I'm not one of those people, but it's fine if you do, and you just want to check out where your money's going and all that, and, and you're interested in, in gain, and you're not interested in loss, and the bull and the bear and the market and all those things, and you got all that stuff going on. I understand all that, but here's the deal. When you make an investment, you care about it. Come on, somebody. I was at all of my kids' ball games. Kathy was at all their ball games because I, I had to, she had to give me mouth to mouth at the, um, at the finish line one day. Well, it was kind of kissing, but I, Zach goes, I need football cleats for football. And he said, I'd like those. And I looked, and his shoes cost more than my first car. I had a heart attack. I passed out. I said, oh, honey, give me mouth to mouth. <sighs> okay, give me mouth to mouth again. <laughs> hey, man, I better change subjects. It's getting warm in here and empty humidity. Come on, somebody. Now, here's the deal. When I go pay... More for one pair of shoes than I did in my first car. That kid better not sit on the bench. <laughs> and we, we, I say, I didn't buy, listen, I didn't buy no $119 shoes for you to sit on the bench. Come on, somebody. And we bought shoes, and we bought clothes, and we bought equipment. We bought, and you know what? We invested in them, and we wanted to see what was getting on return in our investment. Come on, somebody. And for mom, it was good enough because her boys looked cute in their uniforms. She would say, oh, they're so cute. I said, they're not cute. They're ferocious, mean, fighting machines. And then when Keila raised up, we went to her first game. She walked, she ran out there in her little uniform. I said, ain't she cute? Oh, she can't be cute. She's a mean fighting machine. Now, you right there, you got to treat her just the same as the boys. I said, it's not the same, honey. I'm sorry. Listen, when you invest in something, when you invest in your church, for example, you're going to be here to follow your money trail. You're going to be here because it's a piece of you is here. Come on, somebody. You know, these folks that show up a few times a year, I love them, and we're going to say hi. It's great to see you. But you can't build a church on people like that. You just can't. Shout, I'm not like that. Command those who are rich in this present age that they should not be haughty, nor trust in the uncertainty of riches, but in the living God who gives richly them all things to enjoy. Let them do good. Come on, church that they may be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for yourselves a good foundation for the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. You and I have been given a job. We've been given ability and talents. I know many of you are so talented and gifted, and you work so hard. God has laid all of that into your life not only for you to provide for your household, but to provide for his household. Here's another principle we've forgotten. It's number seven. Earth isn't my home. Heaven is my home, not earth. I mean, I'm telling you, I feel like a, more of a stranger than I've ever felt in my own world. Come on, somebody. In Hebrews 11, 13, these all died in faith, not having received them, the promises. But watch this. They embraced them, having seen them afar off, and they made this confession that they were strangers and they were pilgrims on the earth. The, things, the, the, the difference between a pilgrim and someone who is sightseeing is that people who sightsee, you know, I can remember going to Poland at the Osnagora in Częstochowa, Poland. It's a massive Catholic cathedral. And, and when we went... We've gone there twice, 
and we had big old heavy suitcases filled with gear, filled with clothes, shoes, you know, hair products. Come on, somebody. And, um, and then every time we've gone, they have these pilgrims, and they will travel from on the other side of Europe, and know no matter how many days they've had to come or weeks or months, and you watch them come running across that field when they finally get there. It's a pilgrimage for them. They have a little bitty backpack. And there's a difference between traveling heavy and traveling light. You remember the movies and the wagon trains when, they, when they'd get attacked, they threw off all the extra cargo? What about those movies with ships? It happened in Jonah's day. When the winds was tossing the ship, they took all the unnecessary cargo. You and I will be surprised how heavy our lives are until we start getting off some unnecessary weight. Casting off the weight that does so easily beset us. Come on. We, gonna, we need to get down. We got just a little backpack, a few necessities. Come on. The bare necessities. Come on, somebody. Amen. So all this stuff, all this stuff is just really not as important. What's important is where I'm going. Amen, somebody. And that brings me to this principle. We need to live not for the dot, but for the line. That dot is your time on earth. That line is for all of eternity. And how many people get all wrapped up in that teeny little bitty bitty dot? Everything is about that dot, and they forget the line of infinity that will never end, and they're going to spend eternity somewhere based on how they lived in that little moment. That blink of the eye, that little vapor. Your life is a moment. It's a vapor. It goes. It's like grass that withers. It fades away. And now we stand before God, and he will say, either well done, good and faithful servant, or I depart from me, worker of iniquity, I never knew you. And we're going to spend eternity on that line based on how we live that dot. My God, I feel the Holy Ghost right here, right now. Ecclesiastes says in, in 5 and 15, I came into this world naked. How many know that? And when I leave, that's how I'm going out. Come on, somebody. I came in with my birthday suit when all the dust settles. I just need a little bigger one. Come on, somebody. And I'm not care. I worked hard all my life, but I will carry nothing in my hand with me when I leave. I'm reading through A.W. Tozer's devotions for my reading through the Bible this week. And here's a quote from this great man of God who passed away in 1963. He says, now listen to me. I want you all to get this. Whatever is given to God has immortality immediately attached to it. Immortality. When, when I give something to God, when I give to the work of God, all of a sudden, eternity in heaven gets attached to it. Whew. And that seed is planted in the ground, and it will bring forth a great harvest. Hallelujah. Now, listen to me. Today, when you give to the work of the Lord, I'm looking for someone with a tithe envelope. i got to keep going all the way back. How many rows i got to go? Thank you, Mary. Amen. Listen, in a minute, Mary and Chris are going to deposit this, and it's going to leave their hand. It's going to leave their hand, and they're going to walk out without it. But that doesn't mean it leaves their life. That doesn't mean it leaves. They, when, when they bring that, God puts eternity on it. Immortality on it. It cannot die. It will do what it was set up to do. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a shout of praise, everybody. Amen. 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 Oh, this would be a good time for a praise break. I just got a couple more. Get to your feet and give Jesus who saved you and rescued you and meeting all your needs. Give him some praise. Amen. This young man just got home from six months in rehab in uh, uh, North Carolina, Virginia. Virginia, you're free from drugs, and you're going to stay free. Come on, somebody. Give him a God bless you. Wow. If you haven't opened your treasure chest yet, you can be seated. I'm going to find out. You've already snuck a peek. You have to remain standing. Hoo, 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 getting busted. If you haven't opened your treasure chest, you can be seated. 
Clayton, why was you so slow sitting down? You opened yours, didn't you? So you have to stand the rest of service. Here we go. <laughs> no, you can sit down. At least he's being honest. Hallelujah. <laughs> Number nine. Giving to God is the only antidote for materialism. Jesus said over in Luke chapter 12 and 15, he says, Take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life does not consist of those things he possesses, even though he has an abundance of those things. Let me tell you what some very rich people are quoted saying. They said, $200 million is enough to kill anyone. There's no pleasure in it. W.H. Vanderbilt. John Jacob Astor, I am the most miserable man on the earth. Michael Jackson, I'm the loneliest person on the earth. John D. Rockefeller, I have made millions, but they have brought me no happiness. Andrew Carnegie, millionaires seldom smile. Henry Ford, I was happier when I was just a mechanic. The biggest lie about money is this. It will solve your problems, and it will make you happy. Come on, somebody. By the time the average American reaches 20, they would have watched one million commercials. 90% of marriages end in divorce cite financial pressure as one of the key factors. Money that is not given to God is the root of all evil. The love of money is the root of all evil. And when we give it to God, we're saying, God, you take this and you use it for your glory. And, God, I'm going to live for you, and I'm free from materialism. It is a, it is a tyrant of materialistic people who come into your life and try to say, you need this, you'll be happy. You buy this, you'll be happy. It's like I mentioned that car. Go buy a new car payment, and they'll say, "You don't a new car, you don't have a payment now for 30 days. And that car is so shiny and new, and you're in there detailing it, and you're cleaning it, and you're parking way out so nobody can hit it. Come on, somebody. I mean, and, and then a month later, this little thing called the payment book shows up. And all of a sudden, your balloon is popped. You're deflated, and it's not as pretty as it once was. Uh-huh. The, all the stuff in the world is still stuff. We've got to get over stuffitis. Yeah. This is huge. Are you ready? Number 10. God prospers me not to improve and raise my standard of living, but my standard of giving. Woo! God wants to prosper you, not so you can be a great getter, but you can be a great giver. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you ready to see what's in your treasure chest? Not yet. Because I've got a couple treasure chests I like to talk about. This treasure chest over, over here contains representation of all that matters to me in this world. It's not very big. It's just a little bitty treasure chest. If you can't see it, I'll hold it up. That's it. In this little box is everything that matters to me. All of my financial flow goes to the things in this box. That's it. You want to see what's in there? I'm I mean, the intrigue is... In the suspense, here we go. Heaven and earth will pass away, <laughs> but, my, but my word will not pass away. I love this word. I have built my life on this word. And many times... I literally take, when I'm going through a challenge and I need to see a promise, I'll take my shoes off and res with respect, I'll just stand on the word. 
God, I'm literally standing on your word. Your word says that you supply all my needs. Your word says, ask and you give the nations unto us. Your word says that the enemy cannot form weapons against me that will prosper. Your will, your word says it's your will that I'm in health and prosper as my soul. Your word says that I can be happy in my family and happy in my home. Your word says your church will grow. Your word says the gates of hell cannot prevail against your church. Your word says by your stripes I'm healed. Your word says I'm an overcomer. Your word says I'm victorious. God, I'm standing on your eternal word. It cannot fail. If you live this word, church, you will be more blessed in life than you know what to do with. God will come through over and over again. He will not fail you if you just live this word and trust in it. Well, can I keep digging in my treasure box? Give me a close-up. I got a couple pictures. My wife is a treasure to me. I tell her all the time, honey, you're the best thing ever happened to me, and if you leave me, I'm going with you. And then, and then I got my family. I had, this was the Christmas picture we took for Christmas 2015, but I almost showed it, but, but there's two more in there that got here since then. So, so yesterday at this, I mean, how many one-year-olds have people travel from every part of the world for their birthday party? I mean, from Texas and New Mexico and um, New Jersey and Ohio. So, let me look at here. This is Papa and Nana. And we have a sign. She's got a sign that says, My greatest blessings call me Nana. So there's Grant, there's Sydney. I'm going to give him an order. There's Ellis, Micah, Eliana, Parker, Eliana, Micah, <laughs> Avon, and Paxton. And we're making a new rule. they got to have little jerseys on every time they come to Papa's house with the number that they came in the world in and their name. I mean, I'm calling him Zach, Josh, James. I'm just calling him uh, Tater, whatever the dog's name is. You know, but let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. They're treasures. I only got only one more thing in my whole treasure box. That's it. I got my Bible, got my relationship with Jesus, I got my marriage, I got my family, I got one more thing. Every bit of my hard-earned money, and the church is great to us, and you know I appreciate you more than you'll ever know. Everything goes to those things. That's it. They're my treasures. There's no representation of Volkswagen because I've never paid, I've never given Volkswagen a penny. There's no, there's no representation of Budweiser. I've never given Budweiser a penny. Mm -hmm. I almost said Nike, but I remember those football shoes. So I... <laughs> Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Josh, for not being athletic. You see... I don't, oh, let me tell you something. He's the best athlete in the whole family. He does, he, he, he wasn't in school, praise God, but he has to pay for his own shoes now. But he runs, he does triathlons, he bikes, and um, I went bike riding with him one time, and that's probably the last time. I mean, I felt like playing, I was playing horse with Michael Jordan. I mean, I was, poo, poo, he was just slick right down the road. Dad, come on, Dad. We're only going 11 miles an hour. What's wrong with you? I'm going, huh, huh, huh. 
He's a great athlete, but praise God. Listen, it's there. It's it. That's it. And you know why I know it's my treasure? Because my finances flow to every one of those things. I want you all to hear me. When you fall in love with some, something or someone, your money will go right after it. And you won't even put a pencil and a paper to it. I have never put a calculator to the dollars I've given to God. I've never put a pencil to the dollars I've given to my children, my grandchildren. Come on, somebody. It's a joy to give to people that I love. It's a joy to bring my tithes to the work of the Lord. I don't have to tithe. I get to tithe. I don't have to give offerings. I get to give offerings. <laughs> so I want to get you back into one more text. It's Matthew. Jesus was talking about this man. It's found in Matthew 13 and 44. It talks about a man who found a treasure in a field. He found a treasure in a field. And the word says with joy, he went and bought that, that field. He paid everything for all of that field for one treasure he found within the field. Do you know that's what Jesus did for us? He saw a treasure in us. He laid his life down. He paid too high a price, but he saw a treasure in us, so he did it. And now we go by with all of our hearts everything that we can give to the work of the Lord to gain the jewel of great price, the pearl called Jesus. This treasure chest Listen, I have a big heart, but this isn't mine. Wherever your heart is, there will your treasure be also. It's the treasure principle. Church, anybody like a little uh, snack? Come on up. Boy, they'll run the altar for chocolate all day. Open your little treasure chest. Olympia Candies made those for us. Remember last week how I told you you can never eat those peas? I'm not going to tell you that about this chocolate. But just not now. I want to close with one more story. Anybody been real glad they've been in God's house today? Because when I come to give in the offering today, don't you dare make it about green piece of paper with dead presidents on it. Don't you dare do that. That's a mistake. It is not about currency. Because I've got promise, I gotta promise you this. God does not need your money. He wants your heart, and he knows he has your heart when he has your. That's how he knows. So today, what you're doing, when you come to the offering, you're taking your heart. And you're saying, God, wherever my heart is, there's my treasure. And you're placing it in the house of God. A rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I do to follow you? Jesus said, keep the commandments. Don't worry, I'm going to wash my hand before I shake yours. If I give you a hug and you'll feel a little extra rub on your back today, thank you. Well, I kept the commandments, the young man said. Well, just follow and do the word. Well, I've done all that since I was a child, Lord. What must I do to follow you? And Jesus says, well, I'd like your heart. He said, okay, Lord, I want to give you my heart. And Jesus said, okay, well, just give me your money. I know I have your heart when I get your finances. That's the principle. That's, the, that's how it works. Now, you can ask Grant, and you can ask Micah in a couple more months. 
You can ask Ellie. You can ask Kathy. You can ask the deacons and the trustees and the offering team at this church. Do you think pastor loves you? Ask him. Ask him. When I met that redhead, I was getting $20 allowance at college a month. And I fell in love with her so much, we'd wait for Sunday night to have a date. We'd go to the Bible Baptist College pizza place. And you could buy a big hunk of slice of pizza for $1. And I pulled up to pick her up for our Sunday night date. And I reached, made sure I had at least a dollar bill in my pocket. Because I was a high roller. And we cut it in half, and I'd make sure I got, since I was bigger, it only made sense I got the biggest half, but she got 30%. That was back in 1979. I've done everything I can to take care of her, to be good to her and bless her, because she has my heart. this great young man when I saw that beautiful little bride from New Mexico enter his life and then last year they gave us that cute little brown eyed boy does Micah have him some brown eyes you can see him I thought it was worth it I'm not even going to charge you for all the hundreds and thousands of dollars you cost me growing up I don't even think about it. Listen, church, today, if you're thinking about it, oh, dear God, I got a $50 tithe. This should be $60. I got $100. And dear Lord, I just, oh, it just hurts so bad. Your heart's not right. If it's something you're just worried about and thinking about it, oh, dear God, I don't know. I want to. I've just been struggling so much. It starts with your heart, not your wallet. It's not about, it's never been about your wallet. It's about your heart and your wallet is attached. So for example, I got someone not queasy about uh, cow hearts. Would you raise your hand? You're not queasy a bit about it. Come here, Brian. Inside that cow heart, you're going to find something. Dig it out. What was in it? Money. A blessing. It's yours. Your heart and your money are the same. Am I making my point? Let's stand and give the Lord worship. Thank you, Jesus. I feel the Holy Ghost right now. If you're here and your life is not going a direction you need it to go, it could not. It could be something other than just finance. I want you to hear me. It always goes back to your heart. Always. The word says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. Your heart is deceitfully wicked. Who shall know it? Your heart can lead you astray if you follow it. You've got to let your heart follow the word. How many of you can honestly say, there's been a time in my life I got so off course, I couldn't even know who I was. How many would raise your hand? And you know what I'm talking. I got so off course, I just forgot. I didn't even know myself. You know what I'm talking about? Now watch this. I got a question for you. When that happened to you, was your heart right? How many remember a time when you got back on course and you came to Jesus and you determined to live for him? Would you raise your hand? What happened? You got your heart right. Finances is the same thing. We got to get our heart right about finances. We just got to do that. We've, we've, it's not about church bills. It's not about any of those things. It's about you and your heart. Your treasure and your heart are the same. More than you'll ever realize, God wants to bless this church. He wants to bless your life. He wants you to be free from need and want and pressure. He wants to supply all of your needs. If you're here right now and you need a job or a better job, I want you to come quickly. A 
job or a better job. I may have asked some of these questions last week. I don't even remember. But how many of you here, you can honestly say, I, I'm under... I'm under financial pressure. Would you raise your hand if that's you? Would you come and stand if you're not here already? Come on. There's something about coming to the altar and stepping out in confidence and courage that makes the difference. I could pray for you in your seat, but I want to call you forward. It's telling the Lord how serious you are. You can walk 20, 30 feet to the altar. Don't hurt anything. How many of you are concerned about your debt load? You're upside down on life. Come on, you just... I mean, you, you, there are, there are, most American families could sell everything they have and still not get out of debt. Don't be upside down. God doesn't want that for you. If that's you, come on. Thank you. Thank you. School debt, medical debt, Credit card debt, car debt, too much. Too many payments, too many collections, too much pressure. I want to just promise all of you this. God knows your situation. God's not down on you. He doesn't feel disappointed about you. How many of you, there have been a time that you could have sure walked up here, but you're out of it now when you raise your hand? Raise it. Let me hold. Let me see it. I want y'all to turn around and look at these hands. Let, let me see it. Testify about that. Look, they were right where you were some time ago, and now they're not. And what God did for them, He's going to do for you. All of you who just raised your hand, you know where they're at. I want you to come and find somebody to stand with. Put your hand on their back, and we're going to pray, and then we're going to receive an indication of our heart today. Hallelujah. Because God is faithful. God opens doors that no one can open. He makes a way where no one makes a way. He provides where no one can provide. Listen, your job isn't even your source. The government's not your source. Uh, nothing's your source but Jesus. Nothing's your source but Jesus. He's a provider. come and I want you to release your faith she's going to pray a word and you're going to align your heart with this word and come in agreement with this word right now and we're going to pray about the condition of your situation and you are going to watch how God turns this around I'm prophesying God will turn this around this is temporary and seasonal would you all stretch your hand toward these are, these are the altar Father God, we love and adore you. We worship you, Father. We thank you, God, that you are provider. I thank you, Father, that in your hand is the answer to every need that we have. I thank you, God, that there is not one person up here this morning that you don't know by name, as my husband said a moment ago. God, you know what their checkbook looks like. You know what their financial situation looks like and today in the name of Jesus they've made a step of faith they came forward and said I need something God some of them need jobs and I pray father that doors will open I pray for favor in the workplace in Jesus name God I pray that doors would open they would never dream could have opened God that you would make a way where it seems that there is no way in Jesus name I pray God that the, jo the perfect job you have for them will become available in the name of Jesus. Oh, she and they are called the Lord, she and they are shunned the Lord, she and they. Oh, Father God, I pray for our city right now. I pray, God, that you would prosper our city. I pray, Father, for factories to move in. I pray, God, for people with great work ethic to step into the place they need to be in the name of Jesus. God, those who are standing here today, God, be a blessing to them in Jesus' name. Father, 
Father, I pray, Father, for those who came with huge debt. God, you know their minds today. You know the weight that they carry as a result of that debt. And I pray, God, for favor on them. I pray, Father, that you will help them to strategize. God, that their money would be expanded. In the name of Jesus, provide a way, God, that they could be taken care of, Father. God, for those who've just been just been difficult for them, Father, to manage money. I pray, Father, that they would find and seek proper help in Jesus' name. God, make a way. Provide for your children. God, above all else, make us givers as you are a giver, God. You loved us enough that you gave the only and the best son that you had, Father. And I pray, Father, that we would get our heads wrapped around that concept, that we can trust you. God, you don't need our green pieces of paper. God, you don't need our green pieces of paper. But, Father, you need our hearts. And as God, we submit our total heart to you, and we step into an area of trust, not self-sufficient, but trust in you, God. You can move, and so I ask today, God, people standing here this morning, God, would move to a place that you would have their heart. God, if the heart issue is fixed, the rest will take care of itself. So make us be people of confidence and trust in you today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. This morning, we have so many wonderful new families in our church. You have not known what's happened to Kathy and me many years ago. If you, I know some of you know the story, but you should be patient real fast with me. You need to hear this. We were a young married couple with one child. I lost my job. It closed. We moved down and was living upstairs with her parents. You know I'm not the most humblest person in the world. You all know that. And, man, that hurt me. I did not want to have to move in with her mom and dad. I mean, in no way, no how. It just was against all of my pride but the job come open that I could help do some work down there so that's where we went while they're working went to a revival and the evangelist said I believe God wants for people to give a hundred dollars tonight if you possibly can come over here honey stand with me you make me look better I just got better looking didn't I see am I one of your treasures you got a big box for that, don't you, honey? <laughs> and so she said to me, what do you think? This is the offering. I said, about what? About a $100 offering. I said, I think that's great. I think people should. She said, no, I mean us. You know, being a man of faith and power, you know, I said to her, you're crazy. I mean, we probably had $101 in our checking account. And I said, really? She goes, I feel we should. I said, okay, get the checkbook out. In that church, there's a little widow who fell in love with me. I buried her son, led him to the Lord on his deathbed. Pat Lamar fell head over the heels with love with Kathy and I and adopted us pretty much in that church. Because later on, I'd become a pastor on that church staff. After we got to Richmond and had been here, about the time we were raising finances for this building, Pat passed away and left me $33,000. See, you're not near as excited as it'd be if she left it to you. But she did. We paid for Zach's school. We put $10,000 in the offering. When I was writing that check for $10,000, I remember that night when my wife said, what about that hundred, honey? And there's something that knows this reality in me, that if I just said, no, we're holding on to it. The church doesn't need it. The vans doesn't need it. We need it worse than them. I can tell you I've never had got to the spot where I had the opportunity to write a $10,000 check a few years later. I just know that. I know that. So, 
So as we go through the school called the blessed life, when you pray and obey, somewhere, somehow, if God can get it through you, he'll get it to you.